Well, I want to uh, thank Alan and, and Ross and the others from the Twin Cities Creation Science Association for inviting me this evening. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's good to be here on this cold January night. Thank you all for, for coming out as well. Um, just before I get started, I often get asked, you know, what do you do now? People remember me back in the day when I had more hair and I was a professional tennis player. And uh, so what do I do now? Well, I have, uh, I think the, the thing I'm most um, thankful for is a family. I'm married to Brody, uh, a, a girl that I've known for um, almost my entire life. We met when we were eight and five years old. And uh, her family was saved through my mother. I came to Christ through my mother, so uh, very, very blessed to uh, be married to Brody. We have a, a son named Tommy, who is four and a half years old, and uh, we have two Labrador Retrievers as well. So uh, that's, that's the family front. Some of you have probably heard of the Christian Worldview. Oops, I guess we'd almost slide for that. The Christian Worldview radio program. Uh, that's every Saturday morning. Uh, I've been doing that um, for the last, about the last 15 years or so. I, I played professional tennis from 1988 to 2001, so between the ages of 19 and 32. And then I came off the tour and I was trying to figure out what the next step in my life was going to be. And somehow I got involved in Christian radio through very unexpected circumstances. So uh, that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years or so. So tonight I'd like to discuss um, why the biblical young earth view of the universe is the most reasonable view and what the ramifications are for either rejecting or believing it or as the title of the message is how a young earth answers man's oldest problem now we've all heard the triumvirate you know the three part what i call viqs in life very important questions where did i come from why am i here and where am I going after I die? And, and these are life and eternity changing questions, dealing with origins, dealing with purpose or meaning in life, and dealing with eternity. Now, I could be wrong because I can't read people's minds, but it seems to me that many people don't seriously consider these really important questions. or. They accept trivial answers to them or, or answers that have really no basis in reality. You'll hear this, you know, my ancestors were apes. I'm, I'm here to just suck every bit of enjoyment out of life and it's game over after I die. Now let's watch the football game on, on TV. You know, we live in a highly distracting culture, one where material items and, and abundance and amusement draw us so easily away from reflecting on these big questions. You know, the word for amuse is that the root of it is a not muse think, not think. We live in an amusement culture. But it's that first question, where did I come from? Or more broadly, how and when did the universe and all that is in it, including us as humans, come to be? that I'd like to discuss tonight. This is going to be more of an overview rather than some of the specific topics, the diving deeply into specific scientific topics that you probably get in a lot of your monthly forum forums. Because if one gets to the, the answer to this first question, where did I come from, it sets you on a course to correctly answer the other two. Why am I here? Where am I going after I die? So the challenge in, in answering how and when the universe came to be is that no one was there to witness whatever caused or whomever created the universe. And making matters more difficult, no one can today can reproduce a test that, pr pr that, that proves how the world got here. So why not? Why can't we do that? Well, because there's a conundrum at the very beginning of time. What was the original something that caused or created everything? And where did that something come from? It's a conundrum. So how to set up an, an observable, a testable, a repeatable, a falsifiable test, a scientific one, to prove this? So we are left to make reasoned conclusions about the origin of the universe through examining evidence from the 
natural world of geology, uh, biology, archaeology, chemistry, physics, and astronomy, and through being open-minded to other explanations outside the natural world as well, like supernatural reasons outside our world as well. So being closed-minded to considering all the options, all the possibilities, limits the pursuit of truth. So the supernatural view of the origin of the universe, at least where Christianity has had influence in the world, is based on the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, even if one doesn't believe this very first verse of the Bible, one has to acknowledge that these 10 words, in English at least, provide a comprehensive answer to the question of origins. An all-powerful, limitless, supernatural being created everything, period. This solves, by the way, that earlier conundrum I was talking about. What was the original something that caused or created everything? And where did that something come from? The Bible asserts in the very first verse that that something was a someone, an eternally existent God who spoke everything into existence out of nothing. And by the way, he didn't need six million years to do it. He didn't even need six days to do it. He could have done it in a blink of a, a speak, a, a word of his mouth. Interestingly enough, it was a 19th century atheistic evolutionary scientist named Herbert Spencer, who recognized that this verse in Genesis 1-1 contained all five aspects of the known universe, time, force, action, space, and matter. So I'll say the verse again. In the beginning, there's time. God, there's force. Created, there's action. The heavens, there's space, and the earth matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It summarizes all five knowable phenomena in the universe. Now, Genesis 1.1, I would say, is the second most important assertion that's ever been made. The first is made, I think, by Jesus in John 14.6, where he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In other words, Genesis 1.1 tells us much about God, tells us a lot about him. In John 14.6, goes a little deeper. It tells us how we can know this God personally and become right with him. Now, this initial statement from the Bible is not written as some metaphorical or poetic literary device with multiple choice interpretation for the, for the postmodern mind. Either God created the heavens and the earth, like it says here in the first verse of Genesis, or he didn't and the Bible is false. If the first verse and chapters of Genesis get it wrong, the rest of Scripture is in doubt as well. That is how critical this issue is. All of Scripture is built on the foundation of this first verse. Now, I want you to contrast this supernatural view of creation with the other prominent view in Western civilization. I call this the naturalistic view or naturalism. That's just a, a fancy word for the worldview that believes that all that is real can be seen and touched and measured. In other words, supernatural concepts like God and, and miracles don't actually exist. Now, there are many variants of naturalism. You've often heard of these isms like atheism and agnosticism and materialism and secularism, evolutionism. Basically, they all make similar claims. The natural world is all there is. We evolve from a lower form of life. There is no higher or eternal purpose to life. And death ends your existence. The chasm between these views of the supernatural view and the naturalistic view couldn't be greater. The Christian supernaturalist says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The secular naturalist says, in the beginning, nothing exploded and evolved into everything over billions of years. There couldn't be a bigger chasm between those two viewpoints. Now, dare I say, while being respectful, that this latter naturalistic view is an illogical and scientifically baseless belief. Everyone knows, or should know, that nothing can't produce anything and that nothing can't explode, let alone into an ordered universe that we live in. Yet the naturalist persists in believing the impossible, the supernatural, if you will, that nothing produced everything with a faith as zealous as the most committed Christian. And I use the word faith intentionally because the Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, as the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, no one saw creation. As we, as we discussed earlier, no one can reproduce it. The supernaturalist and the naturalist examine the same evidence, and each exercises faith in what he or she can't see or reproduce. But the Bible is honest enough to acknowledge that the origin of the universe must be approached with faith. Two verses after defining faith in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared or created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Faith has always been God's test for man. Will we trust God at his word, or won't we trust God at his word? So what is the compelling evidence for a young earth created by God? First is scripture itself. The most straightforward interpretation of biblical passages related to creation leads to the young earth position. Let's read the opening verses of, chap of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God spoke, or said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Now, skipping down to verse 31, it says, God saw all that he had made, now we're six days later, and behold, it was very good, or perfect. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Skipping forward to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Here's the important point about interpreting scripture. Every time scripture uses a number alongside the Hebrew word for day, which is yom, it refers to a literal 24-hour day. Thus, the plain interpretation of scripture is that God created everything in six 24-hour days. There's nothing in the text to indicate that these days should be taken figuratively, as in ages of time. There's nothing in the text to indicate that there is a gap of time between, let's say, Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-2. There's nothing in the text that indicates that. If you just add up the genealogies, there has been about 6,000 years of human history. There is no other interpretive reasons to consider the earth is older than this. In fact, if you go down the evolutionary road of thousands and millions of years of, of death before Adam and Eve, you are undermi undermining God's word and the gospel. But there'll be more on that coming up. So when you read chapters 1 through 3 of Genesis about creation and man's fall, it really matches 
what we observe all around us every day. We have evening and morning each day and seven days in a week. The sun gives us light by day and the moon by night. We have, as it says in Genesis, land and water and sky and heavens. We have male and female of all kinds who reproduce after their kind. Weeds and thorns exist, as Genesis 3 says, after the fall. Only women bear children, and they do it in pain. Snakes crawl on their bellies, and everyone and everything, living thing, dies. This is exactly what Genesis 1 through 3 say. I heard someone define truth one time as reality, the way things really are. What is written in Genesis is the way things really are. Nothing producing everything is not the way things really operate or really are. Life never comes from non-life. Something can't come from nothing. Things don't explode by themselves, and especially into our ordered universe where there's a tiny sliver that's co uh, compatible for the life, life as we know it. The next line after scripture evidence for young earth is geology. Now there, be, there may be no greater doubt inducer to a young earth position than flawed interpretation of geology. Secular scientists who deny that a global flood in Noah's day catastrophically altered the earth they presuppose that layers of rock and fossils, which are just dead things, took millions of years to form and then base their dating methods on faulty assumption. This is the, the comparison between those who have a catastrophic worldview that the global flood of Noah's day catastrophically altered the face and the shape and everything with our earth versus those who have more of an evolutionary uh, viewpoint of uniformitarianism, that the earth has always been the same. What it is now, we can just look at how things age now to be exactly the same going back. That's the dividing line. Now, I was just reading the other day in, in, a, in a book on creationism, how in the year 2000, rocks were dated from Mount St. Helens using potassium argon dating. Maybe some of you have heard about this. Very interesting. We, we know the rocks were formed in, I think it was 1986 when the eruption occurred. But what did the dating find? They're 2.8 million years old. Flawed assumptions and presuppositions, presuppositions about dating cannot absolutely be trusted. Because if creation and the flood are true, there should be myriads of marine fossils far above sea level in places where the sea doesn't even exist, which are found on every continent. If evolution is true, there should be myriads and multitudes of in-between species fossils, which we can't find one. So tell me which one is the more reasonable conclusion between catastrophism in uniformitarianism. Geology points to a young earth, not an old, evolved one. One more line of evidence is theological. And this is a very critical point, one I alluded to earlier. If there were millions of years of death and decay preserved in fossils before Adam and Eve, the Bible is false, which says that Adam was the first one to sin, and his sin brought forth death. Read Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. To have death before Adam falsifies the, God, the, the, the Bible and corrupts the gospel, that Jesus came into the world as the second Adam to save us from the effects of the first Adam's sin. Read just a couple of verses later in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. 
For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the second Adam, or the one, Jesus Christ. There's no chance that God would have proclaimed his creation, quote, very good, as it says in Genesis 1.31, perfect. If there had been millions of years of death and decay that preceded Adam and Eve. And we make a catastrophic theological error when we pro if we place death before the time of Adam. Finally, there's one more element of evidence I'll put forward, a biological design. Now, bio biology may not prove a young earth, but it does prove an awesome designer. No one looks at a building and concludes that there was no builder. No one picks up a book and concludes there was no author. So why would anyone look at the, the human eye, an incredibly complex system, or the DNA information coding that we are all made up of, and conclude that time and random mutation are the explanation for it. That really is the, the definition of willful rejection of the obvious. Now, many of you here today, I'm sure, could develop these categories I went, went into tonight far better than I could. But in the interest of time, I want to get to why the young earth view is rejected by the non-Christian world, and tragically by many Christians as well. One of the first classes I took when I was at Stanford was Great Works of Western Culture. It was a required freshman class to study the great literary works of, of Western civilization. Matter of fact, it's been canceled soon after I left canceled uh, because they wanted to introduce uh, a multicultural perspective uh, for the freshmen at Stanford. But I remember going as a um, 18 year old who didn't know very much into that class as a freshman and seeing the reading list and that the first two books we were going to read in Stanford in the class Great Works of Western Culture were the, the, uh, the books of Genesis and Job. And we get to Plato and Aristotle and all that stuff later, but I thought, well, this is going to be easy. I grew up in a Christian background. I'm vaguely familiar with the books of Genesis and Job. And so you can imagine my shock at the first day of walking into this classroom and listening to the conversations between the professor and the students as they mocked and ridiculed and deconstructed scripture. I was so confused and I had never heard the word God and stupid in the same sentence before, but that's what they were saying about the God of this universe that he was stupid for the way he had created the universe, and that there's all these contradictions between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I was not at all apologetically prepared to be able to defend my view, so I sat there, I think, probably with my mouth open. But in looking back on that situation, I really shouldn't have been in the least surprised that a creationist young earth view is rejected and ridiculed by the non-Christian world. Now, they may say they reject it because the young earth evidence is not compelling enough for them, that there is, quote, settled scientific consensus on Big Bang evolution. But their rejection is really due to a spiritual blindness and a desire to be unaccountable to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, but a natural or unsaved man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Romans 8 verse 7 says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh, the unbelieving world, those who are in the flesh, cannot please God. But it gets even more descriptive as you read a portion of Romans chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, 
his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, this is the unbelieving world, they know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculation, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's what scripture says in Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. A lack of evidence isn't the problem. It's a spirit of rebellion that is entrenched in the hearts of all men and women. Because if it's true that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the obvious response is, okay, so what does this God expect from me? And the answer is worship and obedience. This point of rejection is unwillingness to be under God's authority. Have you ever noticed that all the, the cultural battles that are, that are fought today, whether it's evolution, whether it's removing God from the schools or the public square, whether it's same-sex so-called marriage, whether it's transgenderism, perhaps homosexuality, abortion, all of these issues are a rejection of what God established in the early chapters of Genesis. He made the male and female. He established marriage. He established that he exists, and he created the heavens and the earth. All these things today that we're fighting 6,000 years later is ultimately a rejection of what a God established in the very first chapters of the Bible. There is truly nothing new under the sun that God made when it comes to unbelieving mankind resisting and rejecting his authority. But far more troubling than the unbelieving world rejecting young earth creationism, because that's expected, is that many Christian or professing Christian leaders, churches, colleges, seminaries, and organizations side with or some or most of evolutionary theory, especially the part about the earth being millions of years old and that the fossil record of death and decay preceded Adam and Eve. And by the way, if they even believe that Adam and Eve were real. The parachurch organization, BioLogos, is, a, is an influential proponent of inserting this evolutionary theory into biblical texts. Just this last weekend, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis was on our radio program, and he mentioned prominent Christian colleges like Wheaton College, uh, no relation, by the way, and Calvin College, who are known for professors who espouse these old earth views, along with seminaries who churn out old earth pastors who fill our churches. Is it any wonder why Christians are so confused about this issue of origins? Or that many Christians conclude, well, the young earth versus the old earth, that debate is so decisive. And besides, it's kind of a secondary issue. Let's focus on Jesus and the gospel. To that, I would respond, well, yes, the gospel is the primary issue. But casting doubt on the foundation of God's word undermines the gospel. I mean, if the early chapters of Genesis are metaphorical, not to be taken as a plain reading interpretation of the text, well, perhaps the gospel is metaphorical too. Christians should not be so easily led astray. But the fact is, we all are susceptible to the power of the lie and the pressure of ridicule. The temptation to, to give ground on the young earth position comes right from Satan's playbook, right back in the early chapters of Genesis, one again, once again in Genesis chapter 3, when he tempted Eve. Genesis 3, chapter, uh, verse 1 through 5 say, Indeed, this is what Satan says to Eve, Indeed has God said, it's a key phrase, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the, from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, 
or you will die. And here comes the big lie. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. First, here's the pattern. He cast doubt on God's word. Indeed, has God said? Then comes the lie. And it's not just a, a lie, it's a big lie. And then it's demean and ridicule every step of the way. Let's be honest. We are frail, weak human beings. We are susceptible to lies. No one likes to feel ostracized or isolated or made to feel unintelligent. There is enormous pressure, especially in the academic realm, to conform, to go along, to keep your job, to keep quiet. So with all this in mind, what are young earth Christians called to do going forward? The old earth, big bang, macro evolution, I'll call it a myth, is one of the biggest and most effective lies that has ever been foisted upon mankind. It really is our ages, the last couple centuries, indeed has God said lie from Satan. It completely undermines God's word and takes away glory from him who deserves it. But just as seriously, it also destroys people in this life and the next. If you believe you evolved from a lower form of animal, that God doesn't exist, that life has no higher purpose, that there is no ultimate reckoning for sin, the Bible says that God will justly judge you to hell for refusing his offer of reconciliation through his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, what could be worse than that? And as we've discussed tonight, the debate over young earth versus old earth really just comes down to a simple question. Who are you going to trust? The word of God or the word of man? The word of God says very simply, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word of man says, in the beginning, nothing caused something and evolved into everything. Both sides look at the same evidence and draw different conclusions. In my view, though, the evidence, whether it's the textual evidence of scripture, whether it's geological evidence, theological ramifications, biologic, overwhelmingly favors the young earth position. I would classify the, the naturalist position as willfully irrational because the very premise that nothing can produce something is just irrational. Now, my grandfather, who was a unique individual, he lived to the age of 101, liked to say, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Ultimately, our goal as young earthers is not to just win arguments or convert others to becoming young earth creationists. Believing that God created the world 6,000 years ago or so doesn't save anyone's soul. Interestingly enough, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, it says, uh, you believe that God is one, James writes. You do well. The demons also believe this and shudder. In other words, the demons believe in God, and they're probably young earthers themselves. They were around at the beginning, but they stand condemned. But what does save one's soul is what the Bible says, repenting of your sin to God and trusting in his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross to pay the penalty for your and my sin. Because at the moment of regeneration, when come, someone comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, those scales that came off those previously blind eyes all of a sudden begin to see who the creator is of the universe. So the call going forward for young earth creationists is to boldly proclaim two things. The Bible says 
and the evidence is because only the young earth uh, account explains man's oldest problem of sin and is the setup for why Christ came to earth to die for the sin that we inherited from Adam. That's why only the young earth position answers man's oldest problem, which is sin, because it sets us up for why Christ came. And specifically, the ones we need to influence most are those in our own spheres of influence, particularly our children and our grandchildren. It would be hard enough if the unbelieving world rejected what the Bible teaches about creation, but when they hear it in Christian schools and colleges and the church as well, it gets very, very confusing for young people. So we need to tend to our own homes and then branch out from there. Let me just conclude tonight by focusing our eyes and our minds on the great God of creation that we've discussed tonight. From Isaiah 40, just going to read a few select portions of this amazing chapter of Scripture just for us to consider just who this, crea this Creator is. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the, the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, it is God, who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One God? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. I'm the one who leads forth their host by number. God calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Puny little man with his puny little false notions of how the world came to be. Let us trust in the God of Isaiah 40 and gain new strength and trust him at his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. And uh, what a privilege and what an honor to come and consider your word and what you teach about how you created the heavens and the earth in six days. And so we pray, Lord, that tonight we would consider the, the, the choice that we are offered. Do we believe and trust your word, Lord? Or are we going to believe the words of fallen man? And Lord, it's not enough just to believe the, the first verse of Scripture that you created the heavens and the earth. The evidence leads toward that. But we must then take the next step and trust your word at how you've revealed we, should, we can become right with you. We all have inherited the sin of Adam. We are sinners by nature because we're descendants of Adam's and we're sinners by choice. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin 
is death. But the good news is that you sent your son, your perfect son, Jesus Christ, to earth to live a perfectly sinless life. And then he offered himself as the perfect, sinless, substitutionary sacrifice for our sin so that you could justly judge our sin on that cross. And when we repent and believe in who Jesus is and what he did for us, you promise, Lord, to forgive us of our sin because our sin's been paid for by Christ and to reconcile us to you. And so we pray there's anyone here tonight who's never come to that point of repentance and faith that you would work in their heart tonight because that change changes their, not only their life, but changes their eternal destiny as well, Lord. Give us the grace, Lord, to hold you in the highest esteem and to follow you with our, our, our whole hearts and to proclaim this good news to others as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much. Okay. First question. You'll be able to ace this one. Okay. First question. When you were at your peak, what was the, how fast you could hit a tennis ball? How fast was my serve at a peak? Yeah. At my peak. Um, well, before I was a young earth creationist, my serve was actually, I was more evolved then. <laughs> and so uh, I could hit, no. Um, I used to serve about 125 miles an hour on a, on a good day. So, uh, yeah, serve was one of the better parts of my game, but being tall helped that. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree. The one thing I wonder about sometimes is what's called the firmament or the, the water with all the expanse of the sky, which doesn't seem to correspond to anything yeah. exactly. What are your thoughts? Yeah, what are my thoughts on that? Well, that, that's a tough one because I, I, my personal sense of that, I'm not an expert on something like that, but I'll just give you my personal view on that, is that before the flood there was a, a, a different... Um, what, what's, what's it called, uh, meteorology, I guess you could say, of the world. And so I think the, there was, like it says in scripture, when, there, when the flood happened, the water came from above, the water came from below, and there was, a, there was a different ecosystem, I guess you could call it. And so that's my understanding of that it was very different before the flood, and the flood catastrophically changed uh, the hydrology and everything of the earth. But I'd like to hear from someone who's maybe studied that in the room, who has maybe another thought on what that was like. Okay, do you wanna? I haven't looked a lot at it, but Dr. Carl Baugh, who you mentioned earlier, has a, he, it's called the crystalline canopy theory, mm -hmm. and he describes the material, it's not just water, but it's a thin, it's a thin water uh, canopy that, that, that surrounded the earth with some metal elements in it. And he, I was looking at this just a couple of days ago, and he, he, he was very, very, in-depth description of it. And there's about seven different versions of it, but the first one that he details makes the most sense and is the most plausible. Right. I, I think that's probably yeah. the And it might have led to the fact that why they, people live so long because it blocked a lot of the ultraviolet rays of the sun and so forth, some of the things I've read. Not an expert on that. hope that was at least a little bit of a satisfactory answer. That was much different then. The windows of heaven uh, breaking open would, would be that canopy. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. Go ahead over there. On the uh, question about more about the uh, vapor canopy, uh, Tim Johnson, who studies, he's a theologian who studies um, extra biblical writings, Jewish history, and early church fathers. Um, some of the early church fathers specifically wrote about a vapor canopy that they believe. So it is an idea that came way back in the beginnings of Christianity. And I don't know if the uh, uh, um, Hebrews believed it, but specifically some of the early church fathers believed in a vapor canopy. Mm -hmm. And when I said that, 
what we've seen in the early cha chapters of Genesis mentioning reality, and obviously not everything. I think probably the land masses might have been, have been all connected then as well too. And after the flood, that just completely geologically changed uh, the, the earth. Uh, the word firmament uh, generally can be re uh, regarded as the sky. And that's about the simplest thing. By the way, that Romans uh, 5.12, I was listening for my one man's sin came into the world. I checked my Android now, my Bible, Greek. And the word is not man. Uh, in Greek, it's anthropos. I've checked that with a number of colleges throughout the Twin Cities in the past, and no matter what the ending of anthropos is, or anthropos, uh, no matter what the ending is, it always means human. It doesn't mean either male or female specifically. Mm -hmm. So the word, and that ties in with who was responsible for first sinning, which was Eve. She was the first one, not, not Adam. Not gonna you're not going to start a gender debate here, are you? Well, yeah, gender <laughs> so, so just to clarify, when, the, when they say, well, by one man. Right, uh, right. Well, actually, by one woman. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the word, the Greek word is very interesting. It's anthropos, mm -hmm. which means where we get our word anthro anthropology, right. which means humankind, yep. humanity. Very interesting. Okay, good. Thank you for that, that point. Go ahead. Yeah, it's very interesting that today, this very day, Dennis Prager was discussing with us, somebody asking a question about translations of Bible. And Prager says he's a, if you know Prager, he's Jewish and mm -hmm. rabbi. I do. He says he knows prophetic Hebrew as well as he speaks English. He says he doesn't know what the word firmament means in English, and he doesn't know what it means in Hebrew. So from it's, it's all interpretive. So if uh, one wouldn't have to get too hung up on what it is, because we, we don't know mm -hmm. what the word really Exactly. Means. And like I try to say, that we don't know everything about exactly how it was. I mean, there is an element of God told us as much as he wanted to, and there's an element of faith that we have to just trust that certain things we just may not know. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Um, how would you account for people who are actually Christians, real Christians, uh, believe in evolution of millions of years, have had access to all this Well, I received uh, an email today from someone, I can't remember who it was now, but someone had heard the, our radio program over the last weekend, and Ken Ham was talking about this issue of, look, you can't, have, you can't have death occurring before Adam because the Bible is very definitive on when sin entered the real world, through Adam and Eve. And so when this email came in today, this, this woman who's a believer, said to me, this is something I had never thought of before. So to answer your question, I think in some, some ways, yeah, the person's a professing Christian, and maybe they've never considered that before, and they've just kind of assumed that, oh, I, I, you know, I, I, Ron was telling me earlier tonight when he became a believer for those couple of years, he was a theistic evolutionist. He didn't know that there was like people who believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. That's one possibility. But there's another possibility as well. Uh, you know, Christ talked about the, all the parables in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, that there, it's possible in, in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, or professes to be a Christian will inherit the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father will enter. And he says, many will say to me on that day, on judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. In other words, we did all this stuff for you. We called you Lord. And then Jesus says to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. So it's a very real possibility of being a professing Christian in life, like I was until I was 24 years old. I was a professing Christian. But my life was not characterized by one who followed Jesus Christ. Maybe he was my, I would consider him my savior, but he wasn't the Lord, the king on the throne of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough about him. Of course, I don't know people's hearts. But I think when someone's confronted with the fact that what Scripture says about when sin started with Adam, if they persist in believing that, no, that's actually not true. You're denying what 
the Bible clearly teaches. I mean, we can argue about ex the, uh, kind of the when of creation. I think that's a little bit. There's, there's some wiggle room there. But the one thing I think we can be very definitive on is that death did not happen before Adam. Otherwise, the Bible's wrong. So I, I think it's, it comes down to someone's heart, and someone's hard to read someone's heart sometimes. But someone needs to be, I think, confronted in that view to see where the logical conclusion is. You're saying that the Bible's false, that death happened before Adam when the Bible says it is. And now you're saying that the first Adam wasn't the first sinner. There was some other death, because we know sin brings forth death. There's another, something happened before that. It throws into question, really, the whole gospel. Okay, in the back there. I, I, yes, to the, that question, you know, basically, do people who are professing Christians come in, but who are not really among us, are not truly believers? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, look at uh, one of the disciples of Jesus, Judas. He was with Jesus. He was a professing follower of Jesus. He was considered a, one of the 12, the inner circle. He was not a true believer. He's not in heaven today. Uh, he, he walked with him, but his heart was not with him. And so that's an extreme example, of course, but it just shows that, yes, it is possible. Uh, and not only possible, but I think it happens more often than not. I mean, I'll just be honest. When I watch many Christian cable television shows, I'm not sure why I do. I mean, there is a lot of... Um, fakes and frauds out there uh, that I don't believe are, are people that truly follow Christ. They're in it for the money. They're in it for some other reason. So I don't think that's beyond the realm at all. Okay, go ahead there. Yeah. That's a great question. How much time uh, elapsed between the creation and when Adam and Eve sinned? And we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's impossible to say. I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens. That means he also created all the angels during that time, too. So sometime between the, the creation of the angels and so forth, when, in that first week of creation, there was some time that elapsed. I mean, maybe it was quickly. Maybe it was... Maybe it was couple years, I don't know. Uh, but we don't, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Okay. Do we know the age uh, Adam was when he had his first son? Or yeah. Was that, and we know that they sinned before they had any children. Right, before Cain and Abel, yes. Well, how old was Adam when he was created? What's that? That he was created? Right, okay. So he was 130. So his first son was Cain, and then Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and then he had Seth. So we don't know if it was very quickly after he was in the garden. My guess is that it probably wasn't, you know, in the first week. They may, may have lived in the garden in perfect uh, walking with God in perfection for many weeks, months, maybe a year. I have no idea. It's an interesting question. I've thought of it often myself. Thank you for that. Go ahead. It can't be much more than 100 or 110 years at the most. Right. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, whenever someone says to me, I always say, well, on what do you base that? Um, because it could be, but we just don't know. Okay, go ahead. Uh, one of the fallacies that's quite common is 
sense of dualism, like total truth by Nancy Pierce mm -hmm. laid out in good detail. The idea that somehow science in the secular world takes care of the things that are physical and real. Mm -hmm. And faith is deals with the spiritual realm that never is the most intersection between the two. And that's how people can rationalize that what it says in scripture can be true but has nothing to do with actual history. Hmm. That's an interesting point. I think that's probably correct because you wonder how the secular naturalist, you know, these are highly educated, intelligent people. I'm not saying they're not educated, but how do they believe such a thing as everything came from nothing? I mean, that there's no, there's no science to, to prove that. How do they do that? And then how do they consider just Christians who believe in, how do they believe we're just, you know, that's something that, you know, that's purely a faith and there's no reason behind that at all. Frankly, the, the, really the only explanation for this world is that there has to be something beyond ourselves, something smarter and beyond. There has to be a God, really, because it can't be explained purely through physical means. So, yes, go ahead. Yes. And understanding that it's been very helpful on a handful of occasions that I've dealt with a non believer that was a rank on believer professor. So uh, he's not kidding me. <laughs> he knows better. Mm -hmm. that, that is a, that passage you referred to. I don't have my Bible, it's in my briefcase over there. But that was one passage I was going to put in tonight's presentation, but I, I took it out just, just for space. But that was the warning that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. Be wary of those who come in and sow destructive heresies. It's like, that's, that's what Satan does. He, people may not know that, but Satan comes to, 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 to seek and kill and destroy. Did he really say? What's that? Did he really say? Right. Indeed has God said. That's really what the root of all sin is when we sin ourselves and we know better, we really say that ourselves. Indeed, we know what God said, but I'm going to do something different. Do what I want to do. Okay, right here in front. Concerning the Garden of Eden, uh, how long, I got two questions. The okay. How, how large an area do you think it was and what happened to it? it did it just dissolve or what do you... Okay, how big was the Garden of Eden? And what, where, where did it go? Well, we don't know how large it was. Uh, there's no, that I, that I know of, there's no description in scripture as to, to its size. I'm guessing it was probably fairly large and probably fairly unbelievably beautiful, like nothing we've ever seen on earth. But I don't know the size of it. And where did it go? Well, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the Bible says that there was an angel stationed at the entrance that no one could go back in unless they go to the the tree of what the tree of life, um, and so likely the flood probably took care of uh, the Garden of Eden, um, but it's hard to be I think definitive about that. But that's probably likely where it is. I think one thing that's very interesting is a lot of these historic sites that we see in the the early chapters of Genesis are in uh, is are in Muslims' lands now and are completely inaccessible uh, to the outside world, whether Mount Sinai or Mount Ararat, where the the Ark. Uh, rested and all these different places are don't have access for archaeological teams to be able to go in. I think that there's something unusual about uh, ab about that. So the other question was, what do you think about uh, the other further uh, east? I think I mean further west. The other, you know, like Germany and Europe, about the populace of the people. W were there no people there? Like Paul went to as far as Italy, I think. And then, how did that work out, the, po the population of places? How did the population develop? Um, I'm not sure I can totally answer this one, be, aside from saying, obviously, that everyone came from the Middle East, and there was a dispersion from there. And especially, the, diver the dispersion came after the Tower of Babel, Babel in, uh, I think, is Genesis 11. Uh, when they were dispersed according to languages, when God saw them you know, trying to make a tower to the sky, making a name for themselves, nothing will be kept from them. You change their languages, and that's where the dispersion happened. 
Now likely they didn't go to the ends of the earth at that time, they just slowly started to spread, spread out. And so Europe was probably on the far stretches of, of that at that particular point. So it probably wasn't that populated, but over time became much more populated. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the question of death, um, does that refer to humans? I mean, God said in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Ken chose animals piled up in bones, but um, just thinking about it over a long haul and ecology and so on, it seems he's talking about when man dies. Um, so the question is, when, when, you know, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Did that include animals as well? No, it did. We're, when people, I, I've always been uncomfortable with the proof that, <clears throat> or the argument that if, if you reject this, you reject that. There was death before the mm. law, but it seems, it, I don't know that it would be contradictory if animals died before the fall, but that he said in the day you eat of it, you will surely mm. die. So the question is basically when God said, when you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die, that only was pertained to Adam and not to animals. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that was the case. Um, does anyone have an answer to that particular question? Well, my thought is that the earth was cursed right away. It was cursed, right. So everything went to pot. Right. Immediately. Well, DNA Rome, and everything started breaking down. So. Ro Romans 8, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. And so the whole creation was afflicted by Adam's sin. The animals didn't sin, Adam did. Right. Um, but then you're saying, could the animals have died before that time? And I don't think so, because I think Adam's sin was what led to not only his physical and spiritual death, um, but the animals dying as well. Okay, who, who hasn't had, okay, who hasn't asked, well, let's get those who haven't asked, asked a question. Go ahead first. Well, when God said everything was good. Very good. And we have a pole star that is the, what the earth rotates around. We put the sun and the moon to rule the night and the day. The moon to this day lifts up the earth and causes the tides to flow Okay. Right. Okay. I've never heard that, but uh, thank you for adding that. Interesting. Okay, go ahead. Personally, you know, 
the evidence is pretty clear that as science continues to unfold, especially with microevolution or, or microbiology, that there's some serious problems with macroevolution. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, abiogenesis and all of that. How does it go back, you know, you know to old and young? It's a challenge within Christianity because we're already splintering. I don't know, it's tough, but that's what they do. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. And just some brief uh, advice if you could share for those of us who know perhaps some 18 year olds at the okay. UAM at Forever. Uh, in, a, in a class like that, what, what would be some advice for that 18, 19 year old in that type of class? Well, I, I'm glad you asked because I, oops, we, we have a book. <laughs> Don't mean to shamelessly promote a book here, but I wrote a book about this called The University of Destruction. And, and this book is it's the first book I wrote. And we, we have them here tonight as, as well as a second book. They're both owned by the radio program, by the way. Um, basically, my advice is, is a couple things. Um, number one, it's always very helpful. You know, the first rule of, of like competition or sports or warfare is to know your enemy. And you know, the world's not the enemy, so to speak. They're the mission field, but you get the point. That know what you're going to face. I did not really know what I was going to face when I went into a college setting. I didn't know what the, the what I call the three pillars of peril in the University of Destruction are that summarize everything I think an 18-year-old is going to face when they go on campus. A battle for the body, sexual immorality. A battle for their spirit to drugs and alcohol, and a battle for their mind, which is the worldview of secular or religious humanism. And so I didn't understand those things very well when I went off to college, and I encountered them, and I didn't really understand not only what they were, but how, to over how the resources God gives each of us, the true believer, to overcome them. And so I think that's the first thing, is to know what you're going to face, know the scouting report, so to speak. But then also, as any successful athlete knows, you can't just have a scouting report. You have to have a well-developed game plan for how you're going to be an overcomer. And that's what the theme of that book is, is being an overcomer. Have you noticed in Scripture how that word overcome in, in like Revelation or, or Christ said, you know, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Um, you know, what overcomes the world but our faith, 1 John 5. Every letter, every message to the churches in Revelation ends with what? To him who overcomes. So there's this, this sense in Scripture of being an overcomer. This isn't a perfect person, a perfect Christian. This is someone who has, has, has a practice or habit of victory over the tests and trials they face. And so the game plan uh, I, I write about in University of Destruction is to Know the scouting report, know what those pillars of peril are, but also have a game plan for, for raising or improving not your academic GPA, but your spiritual GPA, which is three of the key relationships you have in life. How you interact with God, how you interact with your peers, and how you interact with your authorities. Because if you do those three things well, if you're drawing near to God on a daily basis, if you're taking in his word, if you knew, know how to choose friendships, peers, that are going to be beneficial to you spiritually, not detrimental. If you understand that God puts authorities in our life for, not to ruin our fun, but for protection and direction. Because most students get out from under all authority in college. They don't go to church anymore, they're away from their parents. There's no, it's a uniform age peer environment. An environment that is never like that ever again in your life. And so those are just a couple of things I would say um, you know, for advice, but then for parents, I would say this, you know, scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. Uh, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I mean, I have a four and a half year old now, and I'm realizing that this is, this is for the long run. This is a challenge. You're dealing with a sin nature. It's like you have a little unbeliever in our home and, uh, who wants his own way. And so I've, appreciate my parents so much more now, what they had to deal with me. So just, just from the earliest stages, you know, trying to shape and mold our children 
not only to follow God's way, but to repent and believe in the gospel. Because if you don't, if you're not regenerated on the inside, if you don't have a renewed heart, you know, it's very difficult just to follow the moral teachings of the Bible. So. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. That's right. That's the first animal death that we're sure about. Good point. Excellent point. Because they're all vegetarians, by the way, before the fall as well, too. That's a, do churches seek out BioLogos or the other way around? Or how are they growing? In, um, well, I don't know that much about them. I, I don't spend lots of time on their website. I know they have a lot of credentialed and, and degreed people that work for them. Um, we always have to be careful of, you know, respecting someone who has lots of degrees uh, because you can be very, very highly intelligent and very educated and be a fool when it comes to the things of the word and things of God. Um, one thing I do know, I've heard about them, is that they're a very well-endowed organization. They were, they were given a large endowment by the Templeton uh, Foundation. So um, I don't know too much about them. I don't know how they operate very much, um, but I know they are the intellectual, as an organization like Answers in Genesis or Creation Research Institute, as these organizations are the intellectual heft for the young earth position, BioLogos would be the intellectual heft for the theistic evolution movement. I was in a church that they kind of embraced uh, theistic evolution, or they were willing to. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then when I said, well, God just spoke it, you know, did it. And, yeah. Right, people will laugh, right? And that's kind of where Yeah, I think, I think so. I, I found that this, this issue of where st someone stands on the young earth versus old earth position will be very indicative on their, their view of scripture as a whole. You know, people who hold to a young earth position usually have a very high view uh, of scripture. People who don't often take much more of a figurative, allegorical view of scripture, I think, is a, which is a dangerous way to go. The question was asked earlier about animals and dying. Did not God give Adam and Eve clothes from animals? So God must have taken the life of some kind of animal. That's just what um, the gentleman or the lady said over here just a few minutes ago. Yes. But yep, oh, that's okay. That's exactly right. The first known animal that we was, was killed was by God as a covering, and that prefigured the, the offering, the sacrifice of Christ as the, the, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin in the world. But that was after man's sin. Like yes, yeah. it was after man's sin, right. Okay. Uh, are, are you familiar with the Discovery Institute in Seattle? I am, not very, but and yes. I think they are. And I was just going to ask you, have you talked with them or talked people, people like them um, and, and ask them what's the major motivation for them? Now, I know that scientifically and, and uh, to be accepted at all, mm -hmm. except in, you know, in, the, uh, in the realms of people who are older, I mean, younger scientists, uh, you're not acceptable. You're, you're just on the outside of it. Right. Right. You know, I'm not very, f I, I know of the Discovery Institute. Um, I, I don't, I'm not familiar though, but I, I think you're, you are right though. They, that would have a much more a sense of old earth views there. But that, 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 that they also get into other topics beyond, uh, you know, biblical creation and so forth. I believe that, you know, there's different uh, experts and scholars there who write on different things. But I'm just not f that familiar with them. They're creationists? Yeah, very strong. Okay. I think it's more of an ecumenical organization, though. They're not necessarily a biblical Christian Protestant organization. I believe they're 
they're, they're Roman Catholics for them as well, if I'm not mistaken, but they, don't, don't they quote me on that. They themselves intelligent design. Intelligent design, right. But they focus on the design, and they say, don't, don't worry about the time. Okay. Doesn't see design, realize there's got to be a yeah. Okay. I think there are more cr critical ramifications of doing that. That's more general, I think, than Scripture allows, wants us to be. Go ahead. Okay, I have really two websites. The main one is the, got to have the in there, thechristianworldview.org. That's the radio program website. And all the programs are housed there. Um, how many of you have heard the program before? Okay, wow, a lot of you have heard it. Great. Well, I appreciate your listening to the program. Well, by the way, we're going to do, we had Ken Ham on this past Saturday talking about this particular topic tonight. Um, and then this coming weekend, we're going to do a part two on, on this topic as well. So I know you all are interested in this, these kinds of topics. So we're going to do a part two this Saturday and uh, probably have someone else from Answers in Genesis on again this weekend as well. So it's Saturdays live at 8 a.m. on two stations, a.m. 980 and a.m. 1030. And we brought all kinds of little business cards here that have all the times of the local stations on there. It's also on AM 1030, uh, that station as well, too. But the, it's on Saturdays at 8, Sundays at 4. And you can, it's very widely available on iTunes if you're a podcaster or if you want to go to our website and click and play it. It's pretty easy to understand. So we'd love to have you all engaged in listening to the program. Huh. How do we change the course of Christian colleges that compromise? I'll just tell you a little story that uh, when I came out with University of Destruction, I was interviewed on James Dobson's program when he was with Focus on the Family. And in the studio during the interview, they had about 30 or 40 college students. And some of the students were going to secular colleges and some were going to Christian colleges. And the thing that really surprised me was as they talk to the students during the interview and talk about their experience in college, the ones who were going to the liberal or the, the Christian colleges that had compromised on the word of God and some of these issues were far more confused than the ones who were going to the secular colleges where it was very black and white in nature. In, in other words, when professors in colleges read the Bible and have a chapel and have a Bible department and theology classes, but it's not sound, orthodox, biblical Christianity, that's far more, um, it creates far more upheaval in, in confusion in someone than when they go off to a second university where it's like the chasm so big as we talked about tonight. So how to change that around? <laughs> Boy, I mean, it really comes back to the local church, I believe. I mean, everyone who goes, teaches in this university, probably goes to some church somewhere. We're all influenced by someone or something. It's where are we receiving our information, our teaching. And if professors at colleges aren't in the word, if they're not interpreting it soundly, if they're not in churches that preach the word soundly, I mean, no one's beyond the point of being influenced in the, in the wrong direction. So I think ultimately it's the preaching of God's word in our local churches that makes the biggest impact uh, in people's and professors' lives. Okay, good. Thank you.